Good evening and welcome to Holy Cross College. My name is Michael Griffin and I am the provost of the college. I want to warmly welcome all students, faculty, staff, members of the tri-campus community, folks who have come locally and from afar to this really special event. In particular, as our president, Dr. Clark, will mention in his introduction of the Cardinal, we know that some have traveled from far and wide for a conference and will be here with us tonight. We also have a special word of gratitude to the Cardinal himself, who is really battling a severe case of sciatica and yet chose to keep his commitment to be here tonight. Thank you. And we are so grateful for the music we just heard and will hear again performed by the St. Hildegard Project to open our evening. Can we please give them another round of applause? <laughs> Friends, it is my honor to introduce Dr. Marco Clark, our president at Holy Cross, our champion of our Catholic mission as we seek to live out the charism of the Congregation of Holy Cross as it intersects with our Catholic intellectual and social tradition. At Holy Cross, we are so blessed to have Dr. Clark, and it is events like this where we celebrate the whole education 
of the mind and the heart of our Holy Cross saints that gives us another chance to feel gratitude. So, to introduce His Eminence Cardinal Mueller, I'd like to introduce our president, Dr. Marco Clark. Thank you, Dr. Griffin, for that kind introduction. And in that spirit of gratitude, I would just like to take a moment to thank the many people who make a night like this possible. And those include our co-sponsors for this event, our friends from the Hortus Foundation, from St. Augustine's Press, uh, from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology, and of course here at Holy Cross College. We thank you for your support for this event. I'd like to thank our generous benefactors whose dream it was to create this Mind and Heart Lecture Series several years ago, and they continue to support this event to this day. Alums of the college who choose to remain anonymous, they know how important these kinds of evenings are for us. As well, I want to thank and welcome our board chair, John Geshwin, and his wife, Kathy, who are here from Connecticut tonight to join us in this special event. And I want to thank and mention Andrew Olet, who, on behalf of Holy Cross College, has been behind the planning for this event, and of course, our vice president, Dr. Diane Barless, working very closely with Dr. Ulrich and Angela Lerner from the University of Notre Dame, and so we thank you. This is truly a historic day for Holy Cross as we welcome His Eminence, Gerhard Cardinal Mueller, to deliver our Fall 2024 Mind and Heart Lecture. The phrase mind and heart is unique to the charism of the Congregation of Holy Cross and its founder, Blessed Basil Moreau, who famously wrote that the mind must not be cultivated at the expense of the heart. For the better part of two centuries and here at Holy Cross College, since our founding, in 1966, this charism has called us as Holy Cross educators to illumine the mind, enkindle the heart, and guide the journeys of our students. The fruit of that work is that our students leave here as serious scholars, courageous citizens, virtuous leaders, and hopeful disciples. As I often remind them, you are saints today and saints for all eternity. Before introducing his eminence and welcoming him to the podium, I want to give my heartfelt greeting and welcome to those who are participating in the Aquinas at 800 conference at the University of Notre Dame, celebrating the 800th anniversary of the birth of the great angelic doctor. Your gathering is important for the global church that is experiencing a renewal of Thomistic studies. May this renewal continue so that both the church and the world might, in the, world's, in the words of Pope Leo XIII, be heated with the warmth of, of St. Thomas's virtues and filled with the splendor of his teaching. It is my honor now to introduce Gerhard Cardinal Mueller. Cardinal Mueller was the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith from 2012 to 2017 during which time he also served as president of the Pontifical Biblical Commission, the International Theological Commission, and the Pontifical Commission Ecclesiae Dei. Previously professor of dogmatics at the University of Munich from 1986 until 2002, Cardinal Mueller was appointed Bishop of Regensburg, Germany in 2002 by Pope John Paul II later being elevated to Archbishop in 2012 by Pope Benedict XVI and to Cardinal in 2014 by Pope Francis. Prior to his appointment as prefect, Mueller was chairman of the Ecumenical Commission of the German Bishops' Conference, and he also served on the Pontifical Council for Culture, the Congregation for Catholic Education, and the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Laity. After his retirement in 2017, Mueller was appointed a member of the Apostolic Signatura by Pope Francis in 2021. The author of more than 600 works on various topics, including dogmatic theology, revelation, ecumenism, and the diaconate. His recent book, True and False Reform, What It Means to be Catholic, is published by Emmaus Academic 
and is for sale immediately following the lecture. Cardinal Mueller is the editor of the complete works of Joseph Raxinger, Pope Benedict XVI. So please join me in welcoming His Eminence, Gerhard Cardinal Mueller. Dear friends of faith and reason, the significance of theology for the church and for the university. First concept and goal of Christian theology, the use of the term theology for the scientific investigation, representation and penetration of the entire reality of the world and man in the perspective of the revelation of God in Jesus Christ, only became established in the Western world around the 12th century. Gilbert von Portier, Petrus Abelardus. Until then, the doctrine of faith, doctrina Christiana, sacra scriptura, divina pagina, sacra eruditio, was often seen as the opposite of theology, which was co a collective term for the false doctrine of the pagans about God. In contrast to this, the Christian doctrine of God and Christ is a true theology or philosophy, St. Augustine. Augustine mentions a threefold use of this term according to Lucius Terentius Varro in the first century before Christ. Firstly, as a mythical theology of poets. Secondly, a political theology was a state ideology of the Roman Empire. And thirdly, as a philosophical doctrine of God. This discourse on God, which is shaped by the philosophically interpreted myth in Platon, in Aristotle forms as Theologia, one of the three philosophical sciences after mathematics, ethics, and physics. F Aristotle, for it is undubitable that if a divine thing is to be found anywhere, it is to be found in such a nature, and the most worthy science must have the most worthy species of being as its subject. Thus, theology means first philosophy or metaphysics. It asks questions about the universal causes and principle of all being. This metaphysical philosophical doctrine of God is also important for the Christian theology as the so-called Theologia Naturalis or the Theologia Philosophica. For the spiritual and moral nature of man forms the prerequisite for him to be the addressee of revelation. For, very important, in the context of St. Thomas conferences and symposium, for grace presupposes nature, elevates it and perfects it, but it does not bypass or destroy it, an absolute principle of Catholic theology and also of our faith and of, the, of our Christian belief, uh, life. The reception of theology as a technical term took place against the background of a significant change in the meaning of the two components of this term. In contrast to its pre predicative use in Greco-Roman mythology, Theos or Hot Theos, the God, now became the name for the God of biblical revelation. I am who I am. This is God, God the Father of Jesus Christ. It's a name, not only a predicative 
term. It is the name of the personal reality that confronts the world as creator and as organizer and bearer of the history of salvation and reveals itself in the New Testament as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Discourse on God is therefore also an explication of the Logos of God. The Logos, the reason, is not coming from outside to the faith, but is inside the faith, because we are the religion of the Logos, of the intellect of God, and we are participating in the thinking of God. In that, the God who is incomprehensible to all thought and who can never be an adequate object for finite reason expresses himself in his word and in his spirit. So Clement of Alexandria and Origen, the first great theologians. In the encounter with the verbum incarnatum, the word became flesh, human reason is raised by the Holy Spirit to an analogous knowledge of God. In Athanasius, Basil of Caesarea, Gregory of Nazianzus, and Gregory of Nyssa, great church father, there is an important distinction between theologia, doctrine of Theos, the Father, as the origin of the good Godhead and his unity with the Son and the Spirit, the so-called immanent doctrine of the Trinity, and the other hand, oikonomia, the doctrine of the incarnation of the Word and the mission of the Spirit. It has focused on the so-called economic Trinity, on the self-disclosure of God in the history of salvation. In Eusebius of Caesarea, ecclesiastical theology refers to the true Christian doctrine of God in contrast to paganism or heretical views. In the sixth century, Pseudo Dionysius Arepagitus Arpagita distinguishes the mystical, symbolic theology, the piety, which connects internally with God from the external, demonstrative, argumentative theology. The more effective and existential type of theology sees its center more in the will and in love, theologia cordis, the theology of the heart, while in the more intellectual-oriented theology, the focus is on knowledge, theologia intellectualis. This also corresponds to the known scholastic question of whether theology should be classified as a theoretical speculative science in the sense of Aristoteles with Albertus Magnus, and Thomas Aquinas, or in the sense of the Augustinian Franciscan tradition as a practical science, not pastoral science, practical for the real religious life. So Duns Scotus and Bonaventura, famous word of Bonaventura, why we are making theology, ut boni fiamus, that we become good people, good man in relation to God and to the neighbor. The definition of the content of theology arises from a reflection on its necessity as a function of the church. The mission of the church to proclaim the gospel to people of all times in most diverse cultures includes the task of communicating revelation in an appropriate form of language and testimony. Only in this way can the revelation of salvation history be accepted by people in faith under their given spiritual, psychological, and cultural conditions and have a lasting impact 
on their lives and orient them towards their supernatural destiny in eternal life. It's absolutely obvious. Not all the world can speak Hebrew or Greek and Latin. And this is the first task of the theology to translate, not only in other languages, but to translate also in the other conceptions of other cultures. Theology as an effort to theoretically acquire and practically implement the revelation is therefore an essential part of the universal teaching authority of the church. Theology both a simple reflection on faith. Everybody who is a believer reflects about his faith and its scientific, theoretical and scientific organizational institutionalization at the university level. It's very important to have the institutions, the schools, Catholic schools or university, high schools, and therefore we cannot only make the theology, but we need also the institutions no? and the, the formation first beginnings the studies and then to make a doctorate and so and therefore we need the organization of theology. It's first, we can say, historical theology with the task of hermeneutically and historically exploring the actual, actual intention of God's message in the revealed sources of faith, the Holy Scripture, the apostolic tradition, the life and teaching of the church, the life of the church and the liturgy. Second, theoretical or speculative theology with the task of understanding faith in its overall context in a rational way and bringing it into a fruitful dialogue with the natural experience of reality of man as it is particularly reflected in philosophy but also in history, in the sciences of history, social sciences and natural sciences. And third, practical pastoral theology with the aim of reflecting the individual and social design of Christian life in the church and the church in relation to society. In the morning I celebrated for 700 kids the Holy Mass, and he, as a professor, I made the homily, but I could not speak like in the university. But the content of the homily was the same. Love to Jesus Christ, pray, be together, then have the hope in Jesus. But it's the same what we are saying in the university, only the form is different. Theology does not arise from the pride of reason. I am the best which ventures too far into the divine mystery and wants to remain on the secure basis of existing knowledge instead of taking the daring leap of faith. Nor is theology founded on the private interest of an individual researcher who speaks self-absorbedly of my theology, my theology. If one is saying, my theology, attention, please, <laughs> is the theology of the church. And a professor has to represent the theology of the church in the great wide context of the two, two three thousand years of our tradition. Theology is a task of a church as a whole. It's a question of a community. Therefore, we have faculty, not only isolated professors, but the faculty is belonging together. Its forum is a public sphere of intellectual and cultural life. The First Vatican Council, while preserving the mysterious char character of faith, established the service of reason to the practice of faith and also defined the connection between the positive philosophical, theoretical, and practical aspects of theology. Now reason, the, the Council Father said, now reason enlightened by faith, ratio fide illustrata, 
does indeed, when it speaks persistently, piously and soberly, achieve by God's gift some understanding and that most profitable of some mysteries. The intelligentia mysteriorum, intelligence of the mysteries. Whether by analogy from what, is know, what it knows naturally or from the connection of these mysteries with one another, the nexus mysteriorum inter se. And with the final end of humanity, finis hominis ultimus, why we are making theology, not for, um, be, by, because we have enough time to do anything, <laughs> oh, we are boring, we make theology, but all theology has the purpose to lead the people to the knowledge of God and to the eternal life. With the Second Vatican Council, the goal of the study of theology can be defined in its individual disciplines and in connection with questions of philosophy, the natural sciences, in contact with the ecumenical question and the knowledge of the history of religions, though that, Vatican Council second, students will correctly draw our Catholic doctrine from divine revelation, profoundly penetrate it, make it the food of their own spiritual lives and be enabled to proclaim, explain and protect in their priestly ministry or Christian ministry. Second point, theology as a science. Theology as a science, theology as a place of human self-understanding. If theology wants to do justice to its task, it cannot limit itself to a simple discourse of fa on faith or to a mere explanation of church doctrine. This would not least pose the danger of a naive fundamentalism in the interpretation of scripture, which makes no hermeneutical distinction between the content of the statement and its worldview context or the danger of a fruitless, purely positivistic appeal to a revelation or to the church teachings authority. I cannot say this, we have a quotation in the Bible, stop, but this is the word of God speaking to us, and we have to understand it. What is meant? No? Jesus explained to the apostle his own word, and the church, teachers, everybody, also the um, parents and the family, they have to explain the word of God, not only a positivistic standpoint. But because faith does not arise from religious effective disposition of the soul in the sense of the Protestant theologian Schleiermacher in the 19th century, that not the revelation, the objective historical revelation, but the revelation is coming out from our religious feeling and the doctrine is only the secondary representation of our inner feeling. We have um, contact, um, um, anonymous contact with the divine, not with the personal God was speaking. Or in our Catholic modernism was a parallel of the Schleiermacher of the culture Protestantism, but rather describes a personal relationship to God in his word, who reveals himself in the spoken and heard word and in historical events of his historical self-communication as an overarching guiding principle of human experience of reality and search for truth Man is necessarily reliant on reason. Reason is a gift of God, and therefore we have to use it. <laughs> Through reason, he reacts adequately to the whole of the experience of the world. A determination of the relationship between reason and faith requires a substantive specification of these two related concepts. The basic relationship between reality 
and human knowledge cannot be defined in such a way that understanding and reason represent only a system of empty rules through which the amorphous contents of sensory perception are built up into a whole. More or less the position of Immanuel Kant. Conversely, faith must not be defined in a context of a quantitative understanding of knowledge as a supplement or limitation of the knowledge acquired from world experience in relation to an objectively conceived world beyond. Rather, reason is empowered by reality itself in its transcendental cross-object implementation, with first bring, which first brings the unity of consciousness into sensory experience. In relation to reality, the question arises as to the unconditional basis of reality, from which the meaning of one's own human existence as a person bubbles up like water from an exhaustible spring. The requirement and task of life in suffering, in love or in death, death are essential aspe aspects of the spiritual existence of man in the world. In his spiritual self-realization, he experiences himself as being directed to the transcendent origin and goal of everything. Even the atheists, they are feeling in themselves a transcendental question to the transcendence, but for them the transcendence is empty, but nevertheless they have this orientation. What is the deepest sense of the being, the universal question of everybody. For us, it's clear, this is God, the origin, the biblical God, person, origin, and, be and goal of all being, and the goal of my own intellectual and moral self-realization. Man's self-perception as a rational being, therefore, includes the determination to be a, a listener, a hearer of a possible promise and claim from God in the mediation of human words. For example, Simon Peter says with the whole church about the eternal word of the Father, which was with God and which is God, which assumed our flesh in Christ, the Son of God, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. The one God, word of God, the one word, one person in God, Christ, in his divine nature expresses itself and reveals himself in the many human words of Jesus in his human nature, which, however, reflect the one and only and true teaching of Jesus about the kingdom of God, the eschatological presence of God in our time and space. So there are not many truths, but only the one truth, which is Jesus in his divine person, which unites his eternal divine nature and his assumed human nature. This is a meaning of the Son's self-revelation from the Father. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life, the eternal life. It's not a self absolutation of us. Nobody of us can say, I am the truth. What, where's the basis? No? Um, but we have the hypostatic union of the divine and human nature in Jesus Christ. Because he is the eternal Son of God, the eternal Word of God, he as a human being in this union can say, I am 
the divine truth. Not only reflecting about a truth invented by a philosopher, but the truth in his person, the personal realization, re realization of the truth. As a man in his mankind, he is the way coming from God to us and our way to God. And as the second person of the Holy Trinity, he is in his person, divine person, the truth and the eternal life. It is only in the encounter with the historical self-revealing of the human spirit that its capacity for self-transcendence is perfected. This mode of exercising reason and freedom of man, opened up by the word and carried by the spirit, is called faith in theological terms. Not we believe in anything, but this is a belief um, coming from God, an influxus of the word of God. It is not a heterogeneous addition to knowledge, <clears throat> but the determination of the transcendental exercise of reason through the light that emanates from the object of knowledge itself, the lumen fidei. At the level of advanced reflection, this original rationality is called, of faith is called theology. There is a certain light of theology, but this light is coming from the Holy Spirit and make in, make, making unity with our natural human intelligence. Theology is a specific medium for man to understand himself about his own nature as creature and his position in the world in the light of the revelation. With a methodically precise distinction between, on the one hand, knowledge from natural reason, and on the other hand, a knowledge made possible by faith in the encounter with God. Through the personal, dialogical exercise of reason, an inner connection arises between the knowledge of God and the human understanding of the world and of oneself. Theological reason, therefore, serves not only the system immanent interpretation of the Church's creed, but also the mutual mediation between the basic orientation in the world achieved through faith and the totality of the knowledge of philosophy and the empirical sciences, sciences that is relevant to the question of human existence. The scientific claim of faith therefore does not contradict the inner nature of faith or the aim and method of science. This results in first theology founded on objective and subjective belief in the revealed truth in the article of faith. The objective faith is the creed of the church, the subjective faith is my personal belief, um, differs specially from the natural theology of philosophy as well as from the formal empirical sciences. Second, however, since it is carried out by means of reason and therefore participates in the universal reach of reason to the whole of reality, in its natural, social, historical, and transcendental giftness, and in so far as theological reason, like reason in general, is informed by reality. It is a science in the eminent sense. The object of the theology is also the reality, and not only our own thoughts about the reality. We are not reflecting our own thoughts, but in our thoughts we are reflecting the reality, the reality of the word of God spoken out in Jesus Christ, the historical, historical human being, and not a mythological figure, no? a historical person. 
In the 19th century, the church teaching authority took a stand against two inadequate definitions of the relationship between faith and reason. First against so-called fideism and traditionalism uh, in order to avoid objections to the rationality of faith, empiricism, rationalism, criticism, the representatives of these schools of thought traced all human religious and moral knowledge back to a prim primal revelation, which was authoritatively and posit positivistically predetermined for every possibility of rational interpretation and communication. Second, on the other hand, theological rationalism also required criticism. Admittedly, it did not always and in every respect reduce the truth of faith to mere truth of reason. We cannot re reduce the revealed truth to our natural um, truths and, and wisdoms but it obscured the different origins and the different principles, the lumen naturale, natural intelligence, and the supernatural intelligence by the, um, by the Holy Spirit that underlie natural and supernatural truth. In this context, the analogous structure of theological knowledge had to be asserted with determination. For God, as its content and principle, can never be grasped or made available by human reason. Grasped by human reason. It is beyond our human reason, but come, is coming in our human reason. In his incomprehensibility, he remains rather the holy mystery to which man refers in a personal act. The determination of the relationship between faith and reason in the mutual interrelationship with the simultaneous differentiation was also the topic of the dogmatic constitution, the Ephelius on the Catholic faith in the First Vatican Council. The determination of the relationship between faith and knowledge was further deepened in the Second Vatican Council. Constitution Dei Verbum understands revelation less from the point of view of information about supernatural truth and the highest moral principles, but rather as God's personal self-communication in the medium of the world and history in Jesus Christ. Permanently differentiated faith and reason do not stand in a static relationship to one another. Here we have faith, others other side we have reason, but they are interconnected, but are dynamically related to one another and are concretely mediated by the cultures of humanity. Third point, theology in the concert of the sciences. The question arises whether theology as a normative science of faith in contrast to the phenomenological science of religion has a legitimate place in a secularized society in which the consciousness of many people is caught up into an immanence, denying the transcendence in the reality and also the transcendentality of our thinking. The reference of theology, however, is science which cannot be made dependent on ideological concepts of society. Science and ideology, ideologies are two different things. In the materialistically narrow view of Marxism, which negates the transcendent capacity of the human spirit, theology as well as any philosophy, metaphysics, that evades its totalitarian claim, not only have no place, rather they are perceived as competition and suppressed. Opium of the people, drug of the people, they are saying. No? The fascism and all this atheistic Marxism, and also wokeism, 
all these atheistic systems who are denying God, they are saying religion, religion is with a form as ever, is a damage for the development of human beings. In all totalitarian systems of thought, church and theology naturally become the place of freedom of thought, of speech and of moral action. Against, this is a historical challenge of the church and Christian culture and theology, academic theology in the world of today to reject all these totalitarian systems. And we are the advocates of the freedom of thinking, of the freedom of speech and the religious freedom. And we are not objects of the state. You must know it, especially the United States, the basis of the of the state is the citizenship. The citizens are the basis of the state, not the government. The government is in service of the citizens, but the citizens, the people, is the sovereign. And we are, as good Christian theologians and good Christians, on the side of the people and not on the side of certain forms of totalitarian governments. Theology is a forefront of the fight for human dignity, which is identical with the personhood of every man and woman. That is a great message we have today. We have to defend, defend the being person of every body and not an object of some uh, international groups, foundations. They want to shape the world according to their ideas and ideologies. But we have to say the person is the center of the world. St. Thomas Aquinas said one person is more important than whole the cosmos. One single person is more important than the rest. Not of mankind, not, but of the cosmos, of the material things. All material things are created by God in favor of human being. And we are the center of the world. God became man for us, for our sake. He came from the heaven. Therefore, we have this theocentrism, but theocentrism is a Christocentrism and also an anthropocentrism because we are the um, we are the, the, the purpose of, of God's revelation of creation. Because why God created us, no? or we created the world for the human being. We are the center. And no and let um, make these influences and these ideologies. Uh, the evolution is more important as an individual or the universe and all those mil mil billions and billions of stars. One man is more important as billion of the stars and, and the material. Theology is a fundamental science. In contrast to the increasing fragmentation of individual subject areas in universities, theology appears to be a fundamental science. Together with philosophy, it formulates the basic coordinates of being, of thinking, of man's dependence on transcendence in order to then demonstrate man's faithful encounter with God, with the God of truth and life in its inner rationality. Theology oriented towards the totality of knowledge, the totality of knowledge, nothing to do with the totalitarianism, is the whole of what we are able to know. 
The rationality of faith in the revelation in Jesus Christ is also directed at non-believers. Yeah, all the day in contact with non-believers or half-believers. First of all, non-believers can see that theology offers a variety of historical details and cultural knowledge and creative will, as well as containing a philosophical reflect, reflect, reflection that is so formative for the development of human intellectual history that it makes the banishment of theology from university life a clear reduction in the totality of knowledge that is so characteristic of the university. To remember that the universities in the Middle Ages are an invention of the Catholic Church, no? the totality of the knowledge, because God in himself is the Logos. University theology is assigned to the universal orientation of reason towards the totality of human knowledge and understanding. Theology answers the questions, who is man? As a rational being, man has always asked himself the question of his origin, his goal and his destiny. From the experience of his dependence on factors that elude his own imagination and skill, the question of his own humanity is at the same time a question of the existence of God. In the course of intellectual and theological history, great thinkers have repeatedly distinguished themselves with complex systems that were driven by the idea of the question of God and the consequences his, this entails for people. In their density and general binding nature, they belong to the wealth of knowledge that must rightly assert its place within the university. Theology protects people from cold materialism and nihilism. The flourishing natural science of the 18th and 19th centuries were often flanked by a purely immanentistic and materialistic worldview. Although materialism is a philosophical idea, a wrong philosophical idea, and is by no means based on a formal and material object of the natural sciences. Only the material, the visible, the measurable were valid. The reduction of knowledge to inductive experience structures ignore the more deductive successes of theology and philosophy. Their success does not lie in the increase of the quantity of individual results, but in the quali qualitatively deeper reflection on the question of the existence of all being and its relationship to God, which always affects every person. Theology is a driving force behind proclamation. The church is concerned with proclaiming the gospel to all those at the university who do not yet know it and are ready to accept it freely. In this way, the Congregation for Education, the Roman, together with the Pontifical, Pontifical Council of the Laity and the Pontifical Council for Culture, recorded an important aspect for theology in the letter, the presence of the church at the university and in the university culture. Theology is also the, the proclamation of the word of God to the world. In its specific milieu, the university is a place of scientific exchange and a place where people meet. Theology can be taught in a con cannot be taught in a value-free and neutral way. What is a value-free world? Without values, there is no freedom. <laughs> Uh, the proclaiming mission of the teacher and his staff must be supported by the knowledge that the content of theology always has an existential significance. The presence of theology at the universities gives countless young people the opportunity to grapple 
with the essential questions of their existence and even if they are not theology students, to come into contact with the church and faith in the triune God. Theology in dialogue with the other sciences, whilst always preserving its own method and the specific formal object and the requirement of the time, theology can receive an increase in challenge from contact with other fields of knowledge, such as history, linguistics, philosophy, and natural sciences, human sciences. These sciences often pose new questions directly to academic theology, which is stimulated to further investigation through university exchange. The Second Vatican Council speaks in the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world of the mutual enrichment of church and the world. The world has an interest in the church in its moral and social contribution to the positive development of humanity. But the church also owes much to the world for carrying out her mission in Christ to be a sacrament of salvation for all people. The experience of past ages, the progress of the sciences and the treasures hidden in the various forms of human culture by all of which the nature of man himself is more clearly, clearly revealed and new roads to truth are opened. These profit the church too, on Gaudium et Spes. Without an academic and thus scientific theology, the challenges of digitalization, globalization, the technological revolution, artificial um, intelli intelligence, artificial uh, and uh, as associated change in mentality in the younger generation or in, in all generations can never be met. Theology must prepare a new Christian humanism, Christian humanism, responsibility for the modern world and the hope of every person in God are signposts for today's theology. I would like to conclude these reflections on the importance of theology with the words of the Second Vatican Council, the most important event of the Church in the last century. This accommodated preaching of the revealed word ought to remain the law of all evangelization. For thus the ability to express Christ's message in its own way is developed in each nation and at the same time there is fostered a living exchange between the church and the diverse cultures of people. To promote such exchange, especially in our days, the church requires the special help of those who live in the world, are versed in different institutions and specialities, and grasp their innermost significance in the eyes of both believers and unbelievers. With the help of the Holy Spirit, it is the task of the entire people of God, not only the theologians, especially pastors and theologians, all Christians, to hear, to distinguish and to interpret the many voices of our age and to judge them in the light of the divine word, the gospel so that revealed truth can always be more deeply penetrated, better understood, and set forth to greater advantage. Now the conclusion, teaching and learning theology is a responsible, but also beautiful and fulfilling task. But let us not forget the words of one of the greatest theologians, the apostle of the nations, and Paul. If I knew all mysteries and had all knowledge, but did not have love, I would be nothing. Now we see only reflections in a mirror, mere riddles, but then we shall be seeing face to face. Now I can know only imperfectly, 
but then I shall know just as fully as I am myself known by the Logos. As it is, these remain, faith, hope, and love, the three of them, and the greatest of them is love. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Your Eminence, for your words, your wisdom, and for your exhortation for all theologians to work a task for all in the church today. Thank you once again. At this time, I would like to welcome my colleague, Dr. Diane Barlas, Vice President for Mission and Ministry of Holy Cross College to deliver concluding remarks. Dr. Barlas. Good evening. Thank you, um, Your Eminence, for inviting us into this very powerful di uh, dialogue that not only do we need to advance, but also continue amongst ourselves, not only here in the academy, but also in our parishes, in our towns, and in our homes and family. Dr. Clark spoke about our, high, our mind and heart lectures that we celebrate twice a year. And he did steal my thunder a little bit by quoting um, Basil Moreau, but I'm gonna go ahead and use um, Blessed Basil Moreau's words again. He said to us, we should always place education side by side with instruction. The mind will not be cultivated at the expense of the heart. While we prepare useful citizens for society, we shall likewise do utmost to prepare citizens for heaven. Your remarks, Your Eminence, was both fertile soil for our minds, but indeed touched our hearts and brought to our hearts a love for the church of which we are very grateful. Moreau's words laud the intention and art of education that captures and illuminates a vision for theology's mission in the church, as well as a, catechist, a catalyst for evangelization and a leavening force for restoring human culture as a realization of the ongoing emergence of God's kingdom in our contemporary moment. By entertaining this twofold mission of theology as coexisting with that of the church, I would like to posit, at least for tonight, that the relationship between the mission of the church and that of theology can be captured in a more compelling way as the mission of the church has a theology. The inclusive nature of the statement lends itself to identifying the critical and essential relationship between the very nature of the church and its self-communication through theology. As theology is first deeply rooted in sacred scripture and the tradition, it contributes a voice or voices that advance the mission of the church in every epoch of time and to all people. In, Eval and in Evangelium Gaudium, Pope Fran Francis clarifies, a theology, and not simply a pastoral theology, which is in dialogue with other sciences and human experiences, is most important for our discernment 
and how best to bring the gospel message to different cultures and groups. The church, in her commitment to evangelization, appreciates and encourages the charism of theologians and their scholarly, scholarly efforts to advance dialogue with the world of culture and scientists. Universities are outstanding environments for articulating and developing the evangelating community in an interdisciplinary and integrated way. In a dynamic relationship with the magisterium, the university is a place where the church thinks, structures its thoughts, and engages in dialogue with and as the census fidelium. Here the church gathers with a genuine Catholic ethos as one body, and the resulting theological discourse is an embodiment of, the, of Christ. James Heft, in The Future of Catholic Education, points out that the search for theological clarity as a community brings with it fundamental questions. Who is Jesus? Followed by asking how Christians have addressed the basic issues of humanity since the first century. What did Jesus, in fact, do? What have Christians believed, learned, and done over the centuries? What contributions can we make to the common good in a pluralistic, commercialized, and individualistic society? The theological implications of communal inquiry invites an understanding of Jesus, the Trinitarian God, the incarnation, salvation, redemption, and an emergence of the Christian way of life in the image of both Jesus and his followers now. It is a continuous dialogue that transverses over centuries in different cultures and throughout human history, and it is universal in thought. The Christian tradition is both a historical record and a theological understanding surrounding the development of essential Christological doctrines, the nature and the structure of the church, as well as discipleship, worship, creativity in art, music, and architecture. The Catholic University cannot exist without this communion of faith, inquiry, and practice, which deeply influences how the church responds to the challenges that confront human dignity and the common good, and that continue to emerge throughout the ongoing expression of the Christ event constantly revealed to us through the Holy Spirit. Theology provides the language and lexicon for the mutual dialogue between faith and reason as the searching for, discovering, and communicating truth in every field of knowledge. As a dialogue partner, theology participates in the two orders of reality, the search for truth and the certainty of already knowing the fount of truth. In Vatican II's pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, a common discourse emerges as nothing that is genuinely human fails to find an echo in their hearts. For theirs is a community of people united in Christ and guided by the Holy Spirit in their pilgrimage towards the Father's kingdom, bearers of message of salvation for all of humanity. When the question is asked, what characterizes, characterizes Catholic theology in and through all of its form, the answer is clear. It is a sense of identity in its engagement in the world. A necessary component to this common discourse is not to be confused with a uniformity or a single style of thought. It is closely related to what is professed in the creed, the Catholicity 
holiness and apolicity of the church with a recognition that its unity derives from Christ, who entered into our humanity as a savior of all humanity and the entire world. Therefore, the church is at home in every nation and culture and seeks to gather all people in all places throughout all time for its salvation and sanctification, giving the world a reason to hope. The implications for the Catholicity of theology can be best described as communion, a communion of theologies as it explores the in inexhaustible mystery of God and the innumerable ways grace has been freely given and experienced in diverse settings. At the same time, the foundations that anchor this incomprehensible excuse me, ministry of God are the unique truths of a one Trinitarian God, one plan of salvation revealed to the church through the one Lord Jesus Christ. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul reminds us that we what reminds us that the primacy of faith that gathers together believers into one body and call to life accordingly, Paul says, lead a life worthy of the calling you've been called, and with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit. Just as you were called into the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Scripture and tradition are guides for every authentic theological inquiry. Yves Congar explicitly refers to the tradition as answers from the gospel whose deposit is carried by the church as a holy ark upon a turbulent sea with its own point of view to present to all that matters. For Congar, the content of tradition is directed towards human activity as it responds to conflicts, advances, and said, setbacks. Quote, if God having said all he had to tell us, Jesus Christ, no longer intervenes in the world by a public revelation, he expects to see his people giving forth the word it has received once again, a thousand times over for the healing of the world. Unquote. This approach immediately acknowledges that theology is an ongoing dialogue with the fullness of the church as it seeks to construct a narrative of truth, enabling authentic dialogue within the diversity of the human family. At the same time, ecclesial solidarity also elevates the necessary dialogue of a lived faith that springs naturally with a spirit of inquiry and discovery, energizing theological discourse. When theology, as faith-seeking understanding, becomes aware that its authenticity and Catholicity participates in the church's mission to bring to all humanity the light of Christ through proclaiming his gospel. There, the unity of church is reckoned, reconciled by its diversity. It is then that theology advances the mission of the church. By intention, theology turns to complexity of human experiences, and from this vantage point of faith, vows to engage in any agenda for the sake of human dignity. <laughs> My friends, this is no small task in our contemporary times as the complexity of human experience 
threats to human dignity, denial of the sanctity of life, violence, political, social, and economic injustice are played out daily in our secular world. Theology from the vantage point of disciplinary dialogues brings into the church matters that require careful study and engagement with scripture and the Christian tradition. We stand in the times of increasing secular indifference and rising ambiguity in matters of faith, morals, and justice with their attacks on authority as the source of truth. It is a call for the fullness of the church to be that voice in the darkness. At Holy Cross College, we regularly turn to the Constitution of the Congregation of Holy Cross Statement 14 to recall the significance of our mission. Today, it speaks well of the Spirit's guide the church through insights of theological reflection. It states, the mission is not simple, for the impoverishments we would relieve are not simple. There are networks of privilege, prejudice, and power so commonplace that often neither oppressors nor victims are aware of them. We must be aware and also understand by reason of fellowship with the impoverished and by reason of patient learning. For the kingdom to come in this world, disciples must have the competence to see and the courage to act. Pope Benedict XVI urges the church, and especially in Catholic higher education, to be first and foremost a place of dialogue whereby there is not only speech, but listening. He prioritizes the experience of the encounter that materializes, leading to mutual comprehension and the condition of an inner contact. Benedict clarifies, quote, to listen means to know and to acknowledge another and to allow them to step into the realm of one's own eye. Unquote. A listening church is most ready for the search for truth as both beings are enriched and deepened in union with the being of the other. They stand on common ground with the capacity for the existence of truth as a place to emerge. This is important in these times in the church as its dialogue around the world Mutually, list, mutual listening replaces, is, is being replaced by sound bites that delivery, deliberately give way to unfound common ground and untapped sources of truth. This is our charge tonight, to engage in encounters of listening, to be the first to love, to let your work give reason to hope. Cardinal Mueller, your unwavering dedication to the church is clearly the work of the Holy Spirit. We are utterly grateful for your time and presence on our campus. But two things before we end with a final blessing. I invite you all to walk out the back doors here after some refreshments to our new devotional shrine to Our Lady of Holy Cross, dedicated to Our Lady of Sorrows. The shrine is designed to provide a sacred place to stand with our mothers of sorrows as she gazes into the eyes of her dying son. The reality of the truth of God's unceasingly love for humankind is found at that cross and in the compassionate heart of Our Lady. And second, before this evening is over, we ask you, Your Eminence, for a blessing all gathered here and tonight, uh, tonight, and for Holy Cross College. Thank you. Oh, Lord be with you. <laughs> May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.